Good afternoon uh, to those of you in the U.S. Good evening to those of you in Europe and Palestine. And thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. Uh, I'm also a member of the United Church of Christ uh, Palestine-Israel Network. Uh, we're, we're just really delighted today to speak with our good friend, the coordinator of Kairos Palestine with the Global Kairos for Justice and Defense for Children International, Palestine, uh, Rifat uh, Kassis. Uh, Rifat, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, there's so much for us to discuss, uh, but before I jump into the political and theological issues, I know that there are a number of your friends tuning in to the session this afternoon who want to know how you and your family are doing during this time of pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a tough time. I mean, we cannot underestimate what's, uh, what we are having here. Uh, economy is uh, at the lowest uh, rate. Uh, people don't have work. Uh, in Bethlehem, especially in Bethlehem, tourism as a major uh, business in, in, in this area, I mean, it stopped completely. Uh, so people are suffering. There are more cases also, infected cases. Unfortunately, I mean, Palestine hit now more than 50,000, I think, cases, uh, which is an unfortunate because in the first two, three months, we did well. Uh, my family and I, I mean, we are okay. Uh, we are trying to limit our movement as much as we can. Uh, my children, they work. I also do some, some work. Uh, we try to limit our visits. Um, but in all in all, I mean, we are fine and we don't have, I mean, we should not complain. <laughs> Well, let, let me pursue that just a little bit more. You started to get into it. Uh, we're reading about uh, Israel imposing a lockdown uh, with the COVID cases spiking there. Um, uh, yet I read uh, in Mondawais yesterday that while lockdown measures remain in place in Gaza, in the West Bank, uh, restaurants and businesses and government offices and schools still remain open with some, you know, with masks and social distancing uh, and the like. Uh, you're under a, a double occupation, right? The Israelis as well as the COVID. Um, um, you're getting around in Beit Sahor and Bethlehem. Are you able to get around in the West Bank more generally? Or talk to us a little about the situation now in the West Bank uh, under COVID. Yeah, inside the West Bank, there is no lockdown. I mean, people can, uh, uh, I mean, in Bethlehem area, I can go to any place I want. Uh, but of course, moving from one governorate to another, it is difficult because it was difficult all the time. Uh, so we do not have lockdown, but I mean, if you look carefully and you know the situation there, you understand that we are under lockdown because we are unable to, to leave the country. Uh, we do not control our exits and our entrances. Uh, and also when Israel is under lockdown, uh, many of our workers who work inside Israel or even in Jerusalem, they are unable to, to go there. So we are affected by their uh, lockdown. Uh, and I mean, we should not also forget that uh, we are, uh, um, I mean, we are controlled by, by Israel, whether we like it or not. So sometimes moving around uh, doesn't give the right uh, impressions that we are completely free. On the contrary, I mean, we are controlled uh, and you mentioned our, uh, I mean, restaurants are open, etc. schools, uh, you are right, they are open, but unfortunately, uh, with very little uh, guests, because the economic situation uh, is very much, again, connected with, with Israel. 
uh, and people are really suffering, especially in Bethlehem area, because Bethlehem area to a large extent was depending on tourism uh, as a main industry in this area. And tourism has completely uh, stopped. Uh, so people really are, are suffering uh, from, 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 from this. So this is how it is now in, in, in our area. Uh, Rifat, I, I, I wanna get to, to, the, to the cry for hope. Yeah. Uh, uh, because that's so urgent, right? Um, uh, but before uh, I get into the details and the actions, I want to ask you uh, uh, a couple of other questions. Um, our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace is a signee, along with other friends uh, of Palestine. And as you know, I'm uh, a member of the U.S. task force implementing uh, the Cry for Hope in this country. Uh, it uses a term that, unless you're an activist or a theologian, most Christians don't know. And that is uh, that the statement uh, says that the situation of Palestinians presents the church with a status confessionis. Uh, that the very being of the church, the integrity of the Christian faith, and the credibility of the gospel is at stake. Can you say a little bit more about this term status confessionis and why, why it's applied now at this time to the context of Palestinian Christianity? Yeah, although this concept was uh, very much contested among the group who drafted it, but we wanted to show that what's going on in, in, in Palestine, this is, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a normal issue, and this needs to be contested and needs to be challenged. Uh, so we brought these, uh, I would say, old German concept into our uh, uh, case in order to show the gravity of, of, the, of the situation and things needs really to be changed. And it was just like a challenge to, to, to the church. So this is exactly why we used this without, I mean, a lot of focus on it. Yeah, Bonhoeffer ch chose that term to, uh, to challenge German Christians during the Nazi period, did he not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the document also talks about uh, uh, Israeli, quote, oppression and legalized institutional discrimination on Palestinian life. What does that look like today? What's the practical impact of this oppression and legalized institutional discrimination? Yeah, you know, this is, I mean, this is part of the continuous and prolonged occupation uh, which the Palestinians live under for the past 50 years and also passed uh, part of the uh, apartheid and racism that also the Palestinians they live under and dispossession for the past 70 uh, years. Uh, so uh, all these uh, measures taken by Israel, whether it was the adoption of the nation state law uh, or the, uh, their uh, pledge to annex uh, part of the West Bank, one third of it. Uh, I mean, this this is this is part of the of the daily uh, human rights violations committed against uh, Palestinians, uh, and unfortunately, all this uh, is done uh, with the blessing of. Uh, many superpowers like United States administration, this kind of unconditional support uh, to Israel allows them uh, uh, to do, to continue doing uh, uh, what, what they do. Uh, so when, when we say that uh, there are more than 60 discriminatory laws against Palestinians living inside Israel, so what about the, the Palestinians living in the West Bank uh, and, and Gaza? 
Uh, I mean, you don't need to be a deep political analyst to see that this is just, I mean, a, a normal apartheid. Uh, and many even of our South Africans friends, they say that uh, even our, their apartheid was just like a picnic uh, to our apartheid. Uh, of course, there are some other reasons why uh, this is the case. So it is a daily human rights violations. It is a daily stripping Palestinians from their land, from their source of living. Uh, it is an ethnic cleansing uh, practiced on the ground. I know that many people don't like to hear uh, these words, uh, mainly among Christians, apartheid ethnic cleansing, but these are the words which I can describe our situation, and I'm trying to be as honest as possible. I want to ask you just another couple of questions before we get into the document itself and, and, and ask you to unpack some of the actions you want us to take. But before I do that, I want to pursue this, uh, this practical impact just a little bit more, uh, because it really is from the Christian community within Palestine to Christians around the world, and also people of goodwill around the world. But you're really addressing this to, to fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, first and foremost. So the, the practical impact on the lives of Palestinian Christians, and let, let me just pursue that just a little bit further. We know about, you know, the, the lack of mobility. Christians can't go to Jerusalem unless they have a special permit and all the rest. But can you say a little bit more about the, the lesser known things uh, that we know of in the West, like the archaeological digs under holy places and the taxes, uh, some, most of them retroactive that the Israeli government wants to uh, inflict upon religious institutions and churches and mosques. Talk about the, the, the broader impact uh, that it's having on Palestinian Christians and Muslims. You know, let me start by saying that we Christians are I mean, just like Muslims suffer from the same occupation, some are, suffer from the same violations. But sometimes we feel as Christians that we are more unwelcomed into this land than Muslims. And I think the reason for this is the, our ability to communicate with sisters and brothers in the West as we are doing uh, uh, right now. But Israel, uh, uh, runs a complete matrix of control over the Palestinian lives. And when it comes to, for instance, Jerusalem, Israel managed to introduce many laws where uh, they can uh, revoke the IDs of uh, Jerusalemites uh, living in, in Jerusalem. They introduced this concept of center life. If your center life is not in Jerusalem, then you are eligible to be kicked out uh, from, from Jerusalem and your ID will be revoked. So if you work in Jerusalem and you live in Bethlehem, this is not your center life in Jerusalem and vice versa. Uh, when it comes to the movement restrictions over people who want to go to pray, for instance, in Jerusalem, I mean, for me personally and my family, uh, I mean, I think for the past 20, 30 years, we never been uh, to the Holy Sepulchre in, in Jerusalem. My son, who's now 35 years old, he toured around, he lived in the Netherlands, he lived with me in, in Kazakhstan and in Kyrgyzstan, but he never been to Jerusalem because of this uh, movement uh, restrictions. Uh, when you mention the taxes, the, what they call it the Arnona, uh, and sometimes they target uh, these uh, Christian uh, organizations like the YWCA, for instance, they suffer tremendously from this, uh, from this taxes. Uh, the, again, the, the, the famous act, I mean, they try to impose also taxes on, on, on churches' uh, properties. Uh, they suspended it. They did not delete it. Uh, so there are, I mean, in, on, on daily basis, you feel that there are more restrictions impo imposed on, on us. And to our frustration, 
uh, that sometimes our Christians, brothers and sisters, they do not see it. They only try to see Christians suffocated and persecuted by Muslims, but not by Israelis. Uh, for instance, where I live, I live not far, I mean, maybe less than 1,000 meters from what they call it Har Huma settlement. And today in the morning, I honestly took a tour with, with my wife, with the car. We just tried to move around where I live to find out that this settlement is now less than 200 meters away from us. So on daily basis, they still land, they build settlements, and they come closer to us in a way that they really suffocate us. Today in Bethlehem, uh, unfortunately, Christians, they only control maybe less than 12% uh, from the land, and there are more than maybe 150,000 Jewish settlers uh, living in Bethlehem area uh, among 190,000 Palestinians. So uh, soon I, I, we will be the minority in our own uh, area. And if, if Bethlehem will face this destiny, this means that there is a threat on the future of Christianity in, in Palestine. Let's get right into the document. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to a couple of these things uh, in a few minutes, but let, let's jump into the document itself. The subtitle, it's called A Cry for Hope, and the subtitle is A Call for Decisive Action. What are you asking? <laughs> what, 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 what do you need for us to do? What are you asking for us to do? We can read the document, of course, and I have, but I want you to tell us. Yeah, yeah this is a very good question, but, but let me try to, to give a background on, on, on this. Please. Because I, I think we need to understand that the cry for hope is, is very much different than Kairos Palestine and the NCCOP open letter. I mean, the NCCOP, the National Coalition of Christian Organizations in Palestine in 2017, uh, they issued uh, an open letter to the World Council of Churches and to the ecumenical movement. I I was, I, go ahead. I, I, was gonna, I was gonna mention that, that uh, uh, you, you had Kairos Palestine in 2009, in 2017 you had the open letter from the yes. NCPP, uh, then yeah. you had uh, now in 2020, you a have for. a cry for hope. What yes. makes this different? I I'm, glad yeah. you, I'm glad you brought this up. Yeah, the, the, the difference, uh, one of them that this is a call upon all Christians uh, and on churches at congregational, denominational or national levels, not the official church not the institution or the heads of churches only. So this is a call for Christians. In the open letter, we said that things are beyond urgent. Yeah? So now uh, there is no time for shallow diplomacy. Yeah? But now we are approaching uh, Christians. Another difference that this is a personal call for Christians to engage in a process of study, reflection, and confession concerning the deprivation of the rights of the Palestinians. And here, as if we tell them, don't rely on your official church or intellectual theologians to explain it to you. You do it yourself. So it's a call to be aware also of harmful theologies and the misuse of Bible by many in, in the history and also in the present time to justify and support oppressions among them, the Palestinians, of course. So. And it, it is a bitter call. It is a bitter call to churches to reflect from their own traditions and experiences on how to uphold the integrity of the church, the Christian faith, as you said, and the people whom, whom we serve. I mean, forget about the Palestinians. Think of yourself. Think of your faith, your values and principles. Unfortunately, I mean, whether we like it or not, the church sided most of the time with the oppressors. And the Holocaust is an example. Yeah. It is also a, a bitter pro a proclamation that history should not repeat itself. People usually say history repeats itself. Why history should repeat itself? History should not repeat itself. 
the church itself, the integrity of the Christian faith, and the credibility of the gospel is at stake. As we wrote in Kairos, Palestine, uh, I cannot, I mean, uh, we, we, we said uh, any kind of support of the oppression of, of Palestinian people, whether in a passive or active way, through silence, uh, word or deed is a sin. So we cannot be silent. And also the cry for hope, it's, it's a bitter conclusion that we cannot serve God while remaining silent about the oppression of people, among them the Palestinians. The church in, in, in general uh, took a more lukewarm position when it comes to Palestine and Israel. Due to historical reasons and pressure from some countries, they mostly blamed the Palestinians for their misery. And, and, and finally, we feel that it is the right time. It is a Kairos time now for bold and, and faithful uh, actions. And here we proposed uh, seven uh, uh, recommendations. And I am sorry I took long, I mean, in answering your questions, but I thought it's important to explain the difference between uh, Cry for Hope and, and, and other uh, documents. And also, we, we, I should say that Cry for Hope, it is although a response to Kairos Palestine on one hand, it is an extension also to Kairos Palestine document itself on the other, uh, on the other hand. And they should be read together. And it is, as you know, it's a joint call with Christians around the world. It's not just the Palestinians, like in Kairos Palestine and the open uh, and the open letter. So it is, it is a, a bit different uh, than, uh, uh, than the, the, the previous documents. And here we say this, this is not any call, but a call for decisive actions, not words. Because I think for the past 10 years, Kairos Palestine and its supporters and, and many other groups, I mean, Palestinian groups, uh, they managed to build this, this community. I mean, there is a growing community who understands better the Palestinian uh, issue, uh, understands better the Palestinian uh, aspirations. But now it is the time to transform this into actions, not just words. And that's why we said actions, and they should be rooted in the logic of love seeks to liberate both oppressors and oppressed. And here, I mean, we introduced an equation. Uh, uh, why, why people uh, should be split either to support Israel or to support Palestine? Why they cannot support, support both, support justice, support truth. And this is what we introduce in the cry for hope, uh, seven recommendations. And I will just mention them and allow me just, I mean, to, 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 to read them because, I mean, uh, I can be quicker. So we speak about initiate process at local, denominational and ecumenical levels that lead to decisive action. So we need this process to be initiated. Confront theologies and understandings of the Bible that justify the oppression of the Palestinian people. Support Palestinian resistance, including the BDS and, sanction, uh, and direct political uh, advocacy. Demand that governments and world bodies employ political, diplomatic, and economic means to stop Israel's violation of human rights and international law. Oppose equating criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism, because this is one of the most dangerous issues which the church, unfortunately, is allowing it by equating, I mean, criticizing Israel with anti-Semitism. This is just silencing people from criticizing a state uh, when it violates human rights. Support initiatives between Israelis and Palestinians and interfaith partnership that oppose apartheid and create opportunities to work together for justice and equality. And finally, come and see the reality in the Holy Land to stand in solidarity with grassroots initiative uh, for a just peace. Of course, come and see in, during COVID-19, it's a bit difficult, but 
I mean, we feel that come and see is an important part of understanding the context and engage positively in fighting this apartheid. You know, uh, as part of the working group here in the U.S., and I see a couple of other folks, I see Jeff uh, on, on the call here and some others who are part of the working group. I don't know that we can emphasize enough that this is a grassroots from the ground up, from below movement that we're trying to engage individual Christians, small groups of Christians to change to change the world from the bottom up, to change their church's understanding of what's going on in Palestine from the ground up. And so I was really glad that you emphasized that before, that this is a grassroots, that, that you're speaking to individual Christians, uh, uh, and this is a grassroots effort, as opposed to uh, Kairos Palestine in 2009. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, say a little bit more. Uh, you know, those of us here in the U.S. who've been activists have been working uh, uh, to, in our various contexts to support uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, either at the political level or local level, uh, um, you know, talking with churches, etc. Can you give us some examples of how BDS is working, how it's changing the situation for the better in Palestine and Israel? Yeah, I mean, th there are many examples that uh, BDS is, is working. Uh, and uh, I mean, if uh, I can speak about the experience of the American churches, because I mean, most American churches, uh, they took measures, uh, mainly divesting from uh, companies, uh, banks, uh, uh, benefiting from, from the occupation. Uh, they are, some of them also engage in boycotting some uh, products who are also complicit in, in, in supporting the, the Israeli uh, occupation. So in, in, in general, uh, BDS as a nonviolent tool uh, which with variety of, of actions, it can be on personal level. It can be on, uh, on church level. It can be on governmental level. So it gives variety of actions where people of conscience can choose of them to, uh, to implement uh, part of it. Uh, I mean, we, as, as Kairos, we cannot consider ourselves as, as a BDS organization, although we call for, for BDS. Uh, and the reason for calling uh, for BDS is that we see that this is a, a real nonviolent tool and uh, can engage uh, people on a very transparent and community-based. Uh, people can take part of, of this uh, struggle. Uh, it is an educational opportunity on one side, but also it is an action uh, to, 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 to stop this uh, uh, suffering of, 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 of people. So uh, we also, when we think of BDS, we think of the alternatives. If there is, if there is no hope for people to practice uh, their struggle, their resistance, and to see hope in, in, in what they do, this means that violence will prevail, and this is something we would like uh, and try to avoid as much as we can, uh, although the situation on the ground uh, is, is very uh, gloomy when it comes uh, to how the occupation now is being strengthened and it's becoming as if this is the regular and daily life of the, of the Palestinians. So for these reasons, we do support uh, BDS as a nonviolent tool as much as we support other nonviolent uh, tools to stop this uh, violations and to stop this oppression. There's a question from uh, our mutual friend, Don Wagner. Uh, and it, it mimics one of the questions I was gonna ask you and that is, the Global Kairos for Justice, uh, um, you, you know, we in the U.S. tend to focus on our, 
uh, on our political uh, uh, situation here and its impact negatively on uh, the situation in Palestine and Israel. But the Global Cars for Justice movement uh, has, has, has bases really all throughout the world. In our last meeting, you talked about uh, uh, government and para-government and community and church organizations in South Africa and other African nations, India, the Philippines, various European nations, um, really grabbing a hold of this idea that this is a, a Kairos moment, uh, a Bonhoeffer moment is how Don Wagner called it. Um, can you give us a couple or three examples of hope that you're finding uh, of Palestinian solidarity around the world? Yeah, actually there are um, much more than, than three. Uh, you know that the, the whole afternoon. So uh, <laughs> give me yeah. just three. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I I would like, for instance, to emphasize the experience of uh, of Asia, Asia and Pacific. Uh, and why I am bringing Asia as an example because historically speaking, uh, the Palestinians they had less contacts with Asia than with uh, Europe, for instance, due to historical reasons. But uh, today, for instance, we have a real growing uh, movement in, in Asia, uh, especially in India and in Sri Lanka and in some Philippines, for instance. But for instance, in India, uh, I think the beauty of this growing movement that we found our niche by exchanging our solidarity to their Dalit movement and to our uh, liberation uh, movement. So it is not just that I am in solidarity with you, but I am also in solidarity with myself. And for us, this is something important that as if we are changing the concept of solidarity, someone is give solidarity to another but uh, uh, with a joint struggle. So uh, I think this is one of the things uh, 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 we would like to, to emphasize and to strengthen that this is really a joint struggle more than one nation is in solidarity with the other. And the Dalit movement in India is giving this uh, important and excellent, I would say, experience. Uh, also, we can see how uh, this movement uh, is, is growing, uh, how they can also see their own uh, uh, struggle in our struggle, but also they can see uh, uh, what their governments is doing, I mean, to us. For instance, in India, India was traditionally a, a big supporter of, of Palestine. Uh, today we can we see that India uh, is uh, more uh, pro Israel and uh, getting an, an alliance with with Israel mainly on arm uh, trade than with with Palestine. So by by struggling for their own rights, they struggle uh, against their government, but also they are benefiting the liberation movement of of Palestine. I, I feel that this is a very good example. The same now is happening in, in Africa. And also I can see it also in, in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so it is, it, is a growing, it is a growing movement. And the challenge, if, if you allow me just to say, I mean, a word on the challenge, because I mean, in the United States, for instance, there are uh, many groups uh, who have uh, contacts with Palestinian groups. And honestly, we would like to see a more coordinated efforts because the more you are coordinated, the more we will be coordinated, uh, especially that we are uh, lack, lacking uh, personnel. So we are very few, unfortunately. So the more our movement is, is well structured and coordinated, uh, the more benefits we will get. And, and we might grow even further. 
one of the uh, things when I read it in the Cry for Hope document that really moved me was uh, uh, the following statement. We believe that our land has a universal mission. What, what do you mean, uh, what does the document mean when you say that the land has a universal mission? Actually, this, uh, this is a quotation from Kairos uh, Palestine document because when, when we spoke about, uh, about uh, uh, I mean, Palestine in, in Kairos document, we spoke about this universal mission, which is, I mean, uh, uh, to, to maintain and to sustain global peace. Uh, the, the mission, I mean, Christianity, Christian faith started in, in Palestine. So this is part also of our universal, universal mission. So this is this is the, the, the type of u, un, universality of of uh, of our country uh, when it comes to mission uh, maintaining and sustaining Christianity and our faith uh, maintaining global peace. Uh, I mean, faith, hope, and love started in, in, in our area. So this is part of our universal mission to the world. Earlier this summer, uh, Kairos uh, Palestine expressed its unequivocal support for the Black Lives Movement, saying that it was a Kairos moment, that it was an opportunity to recognize, quote, the many expressions of Black Palestinian solidarity over decades. Can you talk to us about that decision and what led the Kairos Palestine board to adopt it? Again, this is this is part of the of the change in in our thinking in global Kairos for Justice Coalition. Uh, that if if we really want uh, to see our movement growing, we need to be in solidarity and joint struggle with other oppressed people. Uh, and here, this is the the main motive for us. To, uh, to side with the Black Lives Matter and, and to be in solidarity uh, with them. Uh, so so f from, from here comes this, and also to show that we uh, Palestinians, uh, we are not uh, uh, living in a nutshell, we are not isolated, we are also communicating with the world. And when we, uh, when we talk about oppression, when we talk about injustice, I think we, the, the Palestinians, who are the ones who are experts in understanding injustices, so we cannot stand silent when injustice is occurred anywhere. So we, sh we cannot just continue quoting Martin Luther King uh, Jr. saying uh, uh, injustice somewhere, injustice everywhere, and we just hide ourselves behind our cause uh, forgetting about uh, the world. No, we are in solidarity with all oppressed uh, people. I, I don't want to sound Marxist in, 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 in this, uh, I mean, evening, uh, but yes, Palestinians are m more sensitive to injustices than, than others. And that's why we need to be in solidarity with all oppressed people. I, I want to ask you about some of your other work too, Rafat. Uh, um, it's apparent uh, to all those who know you at all that you have a real heart for children. When you shared your story with uh, my groups when we've met you in Bethlehem, one of the uh, um, you you share about you know one of the first times you'd been imprisoned. I know you've been in prison many times, but one of the first times you encountered children in prison too. And that experience moved you, moved you very, very much. And you founded then Defense for Children International Palestine. You had many roles with that organization locally and internationally. Um, tell us about the current state of uh, child imprisonment, especially during these COVID times, uh, and about your work with Defense for Children International. Yeah. Yeah, let me start by, uh, I mean, what's, what's going on right now? Unfortunately, despite all the pressure on Israel uh, to release children uh, during COVID-19, uh, we failed. Uh, 
uh, and now there are uh, some cases, uh, infected cases, uh, inside the prisons, uh, infecting infecting others due to the uh, the impossibility for uh, for prisoners to to practice social distancing from each other. Unfortunately, we lost this battle, and 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 Israel insisted to show that it doesn't differentiate between children and others. You are right, uh, Michael. I was in prison several times, but in, I would say in 1990 uh, or 1989, there was an influx of children prisoners at that time. Uh, so hundreds of children were, were arrested. Uh, without enough care, neither from lawyers uh, nor from families, because, you know, the Antifada was uh, in its peak uh, at that time. So uh, going, I mean, when I was uh, released from prison, this was one of my major concern that we need to create something uh, a paralegal committee, a committee of legal people to try to first to present them, uh, to visit them in the prisons, but also to work with their families and to work with them after they, they were released. I was lucky enough at that time that I worked for the YMCA rehabilitation program, uh, and I became the director of this, this program in 1990 where we introduced uh, psychosocial counseling uh, for, for children who were affected uh, from, from the Intifada. And on the other hand, I established uh, this organization, Defense for Children International. And we started as, as uh, an organization who present children in, in, in the prison and try to, uh, to, to make advocacy on behalf of them, to exercise pressure on Israel, to adhere to the CRC, to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Israel is a signatory of this, of this convention, uh, which states that detention should be the last resort. And Israel uh, needs also to obey and to comply with this convention. Unfortunately, uh, Israel never did. And I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate that while we are talking now, uh, at least two to three children will be arrested this evening because uh, we estimate that every, every night between two to three children will be arrested in, in the West Bank and they will be arrested in, in a very violent uh, way uh, I mean, statistics say that uh, after two hours they will confess uh, and most of the time or some of the time they confess on things they did not do just, I mean, to finish this. And again, unfortunately, even the Palestinian lawyers, we plead guilty in order to take them from outside this, this injustice system, I would say. And just to, 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 to conclude with two points, Israel is the only country in the world which trials children uh, before military uh, courts till today. And second, Israel, I mean, is the only country who considers throwing a stone as a felony, not what the damage the stone might create. And these are, I mean, ways to, to arrest children and to destroy their future and to destroy our future as well. I'm going to try to catch up with some of the questions that have been asked in the chat room. And I've got a couple more, and I know that our time is running out. So help me out here, okay, with, uh, with your answers. Um, one of the questions is uh, about uh, uh, Christian Zionists. Um, there were recently, uh, even though there's these travel restrictions because of COVID, recently 70 Christian Zionists were allowed to enter the country enter into illegal settlements and harass, harass Palestinians and uh, uproot olive trees. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about uh, the presence of Christian Zionists uh, uh, and, and what's, what's, what's happening among the churches in the West Bank and in Israel to combat this kind of growing heresy in Palestine. You know, 
let me say that I mean Christian Zionism is real, yeah, and I mean we should not hide this. Uh, unfortunately, they are I mean uh, uh, I mean a major a major reason for this conflict and to prolong it. Uh, and it's funny enough that Israel is, I mean, in alliance with Christian Zionists, although everyone knows that they are the anti-Semitic type of, of people. But anyway, uh, Christian Zionists, they, uh, they encourage Israel with money. They encourage Israel with uh, statements. They encourage Israel with actions, with visits, with rallies, with demonstrations. They might be uh, few in numbers, but unfortunately, they introduce themselves as if they are the voice of Christians, uh, mainly in the United States. And this is something sometimes threatens our existence in Palestine because uh, many people, I mean, many uh, Muslim compatriots, they do not understand really the difference between Christian and Christian uh, Zionism. So Christian Zionism is real, and they were in 2006, uh, the three heads of churches at that time, Patriarch Sabah, Riyah Abu Al-Asan, and Munib Yunan, they issued a statement, very strong one, against Christian Zionists, calling it as, as a heresy. And we continued, I mean, considering them as, as a heresy. Uh, but Christian Zionism, uh, uh, they, have, uh, they have influence. Uh, we can see that they are now part of the U.S. administration. Uh, so they are in the decision-making uh, seats, and this is what makes them even uh, more more dangerous. Uh, I would also say that uh, the problem it is Christian Zionism, but we should not also forget about the mainstream churches because the mainstream churches theology which they adopt, it's not it's not helpful as well. It does it does ignore the the Palestinians. It doesn't see us. So we should not put all the blame of Christian Zionists and forget our mainstream churches. So we should also tackle, uh, we should also tackle this. Uh, I mean, Christian Zionism, it needs to, uh, we need to be together jointly to, to confront them. Uh, we try to dialogue with them, but it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, but here I would also mention uh, the Christ uh, at the checkpoint uh, conference. Uh, and I think they are doing a good job uh, targeting evangelicals. And, and we can see that there are some breakthrough here, here and there. But it is a problem for us and it is a problem for our existence as well. Here's another question. Um, are young Palestinian Christians fleeing Palestine? Is the pressure that Israel putting on Palestine causing young people to flee? You know, anyone with sanity uh, will try to, to flee from, from this situation. Uh, I mean, try to imagine yourself, look down in, in your area, you do not have job. If you, are, if you have uh, studied, you do not have also any possibility to work. Uh, education is bad, health is why bad, uh, the political instability, the oppressions, the violations, the settlers' attacks, uh, the, the settlements, the wall. I mean, everything here, I mean, is, is designed to push, you, uh, to push you out. So, yes, I agree. Many children, many youngsters, they try, I wouldn't say flee, they try to find other opportunities in other places. Uh, as, as we spoke earlier, Michael, you and me, about this, I mean, we, sometimes we focus on people leaving the country and we forget to focus also on people coming back. Uh, and there are some youngsters with very good education. They are coming back, despite the, the difficulties, despite the lack of, of jobs. But people are coming back, even the ones who leave. 
they live, but they do not sell their property. They leave, but they come back to visit their families. They leave, they work outside, but they send money to sustain the, 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 the families. So it is, it is a phenomena, and that's why Palestinian Christians, we are, I mean, having the same numbers maybe from 1967 till today. Uh, but it's not a hopeless case. The moment we have stability here, the moment we have justice, the moment we have peace, I can tell you that many people will come back. I want to ask you uh, uh, about a couple of the uh, real recent political uh, situations. One, uh, it's been over two months now since Israel, with the approval of the United States, was supposed to implement its annexation of significant parts of the West Bank and uh, uh, the Jordan Valley, uh, East Jerusalem, etc. But right, I mean, this is just simply an ex extension of a 70 year strategic plan. Uh, really, it's annexation has been happening since day one under various guises. Uh, where do things stand now with regard to annexation and and is there a, is it, will there be a coordinated Palestinian response? Or talk to us a little bit about uh, the annexation and the Palestinian response. You know, as you said it, I mean rightly, uh, annexation. All our land is annexed. Uh, the Palestinian Authority doesn't exercise real authority on any area anymore. Uh, even with the Oslo Agreement, 60% from, from the area was controlled and subject to annexation uh, by, by Israel. I think the only, uh, the only thing uh, Israel wanted to annex, uh, it was f for first for election reasons, in order for Netanyahu to, to compete with, with others that he is now introducing this annexation, uh, this annexation thing. The second thing is also to challenge the Palestinian Authority even more. Uh, and the third is to satisfy uh, the, the, the needs of the extremists within the uh, Israeli society. Unfortunately, today, uh, the Israeli society is moving rapidly uh, to become a fascist even, uh, even society. You cannot find uh, any more uh, logic, uh, voice of, of, of logic, especially in, in, this, in this government and the previous, the pre uh, the previous uh, government. So annexation is more of, uh, uh, is used uh, as a propaganda. But this doesn't mean that annexation is not a real threat. So annexation will happen. I'm saying this, annexation will happen, but we need to see it in the bigger context, in the occupation. Because, I mean, we saw many uh, statements against annexation, but we do not have the same statements against the prolonged occupation, for instance. Absolutely. So the issue is not the annexation. The issue is the occupation. The issue is the independent, uh, independence of, of the Palestinians, not not the annexation. Annexation is important, but it's not more important than ending the occupation, ending the apartheid. So this is where our focus. The response of the Palestinians, there are some responses on the ground here and there. But I mean, I don't want to, to drag you into that area. I mean, the authority is unable to lead these efforts. Thanks God that there are now negotiations uh, between the different factions to, to overcome this split and to, to have more unity among the Palestinians. We are hopeful and we pray that this, this will happen. But uh, uh, we are unable now. So it's not the, the, the right time. We are unable to mobilize uh, our people the same way we used to mobilize them in the first uh, intifada and also in the second intifada. There are some pockets of resistance here and there, but unfortunately we are still unable uh, to do it. But it's coming, it's coming, because there are many uh, movements, mainly youth movements, growing uh, in, in some areas. So I am, I am hopeful that uh, change will occur 
sometimes, and it might be even quicker than what we think. You know, you just referenced it, Rifat. Uh, you know, just last week, uh, there's an agreement between Fatah and Hamas uh, to hold elections for the first time in 15 years, sometime in the next six months. You also suggested, and, and I want to be diplomatic here, but uh, the PA uh, hasn't always been the most helpful, let's put it that way, in attaining the rights, attaining human rights uh, uh, for its population, for its people. Do these elections, these upcoming elections, do you think they're going to really happen? And do they give you any kind of, uh, uh, will, will there be a change on the ground? Is there any cause for hope there in pressuring the Israelis? If, if, there, if there will be, I mean, a, a positive thing about election, that we might see some changes here and there of faces. And this is, this is important to change blood. But I don't think the, the problem within the Palestinian society is election. I think the, the problem we face that we do not have any more solid vision for the future. Uh, we do not have any more solid strategy. We do not have any more unified understanding and, and directions. And this is where the problem lies. If we manage to have new blood yeah, during the election, which I doubt because, I mean, uh, the political factions, the, the old guards might, I mean, come back, yeah, but in, in different, in different uh, ways. And the reason for this, it's again the occupation, because, I mean, uh, we are unable to run uh, really election campaigns in a freely way, yeah, because Israel is interfering uh, as much as other countries are also interfering in, in the election. So the election is a, is, a, is a good step forward, but doesn't solve the, the problem we are facing. One more, uh, just about the current political situation, and that is about the, uh, uh, you know, it's really been touted by our current uh, administration here, the, uh, the normalization between Israel and a couple of the Arab countries in the Gulf, right? The UAE and uh, Bahrain. Uh, wh what's going on with that? How do the Palestinians, I mean, is, is there any practical impact on the ground uh, with those, with the normalization between Israel and those countries? Of course, it is, it is a bad step, yeah, because this is like stabbing us in, 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 in behind, in the back, uh, because, uh, I mean, normalization should be after uh, peace with justice is prevailing in the country. But normalization usually happened between two warring parties. I mean, Emirates and Bahrain, I mean, they've never been in real war with, with Israel. So normalization, I think it is uh, a propaganda for the election of your president. Uh, yeah, so, please. I mean, unfortunately, again, uh, we become subject to uh, election campaigning here and there. Uh, and this is, I think, this is where the problem lies with Palestine, that we are not anymore uh, controlling our agenda. What about, so, uh, what about, uh, I, we hear rumblings here about potential conversations that are taking place between Israel and the Saudis that would lead sometime to uh, normalization between those two countries. Now that would be an issue, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I mean, we know that there are some normalization happening from under the table. Uh, we know that uh, Crown Prince, he met uh, several Israelis, among them Netanyahu in, in, in the past. So, I mean, even with Emirates and with Bahrain, these normalization things started maybe 10 or 15 years back, but they, they made them in this dramatic uh, way, just, I mean, to, to give some uh, hope for Netanyahu to be reelected and to Trump to be reelected and to say that he did he did something after the failure of the century of the deal. Uh, I doubt that Saudi Arabia will, uh, will have uh, openly a normalization thing because the moment they did, this means that they will not leave 
any other option to the Palestinians than sticking to Iran. Uh, and this is what they try to avoid, of course. So they try to keep the door open yeah, in order to... And this is, again, one of the problems of the Palestinians today, that we see that there are axes, political axes growing in the Middle East, and we are not part of any. On the contrary, we are the victims of all these axes. And if you look carefully, the, the Palestinians, they are in the axis of the American, Israeli, Saudi Arabia one. So yeah. they are working against our own interests. We're wrapping up here, just a couple more. Um, anyone who's met you uh, knows that even in the darkest of times, you exude uh, a cer what, certain what, what I would call a transcendent hope before this interview. <laughs> Uh, you said, Michael, uh, I am not a pessimist. Um, uh, it, it, you know, uh, this hope beyond the exigencies of the particular moment and events of the time. What, what inspires you? Th what's inspired you throughout your life to, to continue the struggle? And where have you uh, in the past and where do you today find that hope? I, I find it in the people. Uh, I am I am people oriented. Uh, I, I never been in, in alliance with any government, with any. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I am I am a people oriented people, and I, I person, and I have full trust that you might cheat people for some time, but you cannot cheat them all the time, and people have power. Uh, and I think this is what keeps me going, uh, that even despite, I mean, try to imagine in 1987, uh, when the Palestinians were, I mean, at the peak of their frustrations and disappointment, a lot of, I mean, violations inside, harassment, uh, we were neglected by even our Arab countries, by the international community. And suddenly the people took to the streets and they created this glory in Tifada at that time. This is where I, I take my uh, optimism. I, I am naive. Uh, I understand that this is a difficult situation. And this is not the right time even to make any real change. And that's why I keep telling my friends and, and my children, now the time just to continue saying no and steadfast. We are unable to change. The, the, the powers are much more stronger than us. We are unable to change it. But at least we need to continue having the will to say no, not at the expense of our rights, not at the expense of our right to self-determination, and sometimes international law, human rights, law in general will prevail. Whether it was a, a divine intervention or, or uh, I mean, I, I would like to see a divine intervention, but even if not a divine intervention, people will, uh, I mean, will do it. This is, this is where I am, my, my optimism comes. Rifat? Uh, it's really great to see you, man. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I miss seeing you in Bethlehem. Uh, thank you for coming today to join us. Do you have any parting words for us? Thank you. I would like to thank you, Michael. And I, I am very happy that uh, I, I, I can see many, uh, I mean, familiar names, friends uh, who, who are with us uh, this evening or this afternoon. I will end by saying, I mean, our Kairos moment did not yet arrive, yeah? but we are working. Yeah? We are working on preparing the, the political context. And uh, even if this perfect moment hasn't yet arrived, uh, and maybe the time is not quite ripe for a real change, but together we will do it. And I will end with this, together we will do it. And thank you for hosting me, Michael. Uh, so, so uh... So grateful to see you and for all the work uh, for so many years, your courage and your witness uh, is an inspiration and a model for us, Rifat. So thank you.